Kaplan. Welcome to Pasadena Photography Arts Forum. Our guest presenter, Manuelo Paganelli, is going to be discussing the importance of the long-term project and will be sharing with us a wide variety of work from his distinguished career. With me tonight to help things keep moving along, um, our fellow PPA advisors, Justine Manesh, oops, how that happened, Ellen Friedlander, and Alexi Butts. Before we bring Manuelo on though, there's something I'd like to mention. As most of you probably know, Pasadena Photography Arts is a nonprofit organization with most of the work being done by dedicated volunteers. As such, we have been asking for donations to help cover the costs of our continuing operations. We're still very happy to accept your donations. However, we have also instituted a new way that you can support Forum and our other program, Open Show. We're calling it Collect to Support Pasadena Photography Arts. We're now presenting special edition prints by our advisors. They're available for purchase on our website with the proceeds to be split between the artists and PPA. Currently, there are two fantastic images available by PPA's founder, Bill Wishner. Visit pasadenaphotographyarts.org for more information on how you can become the proud owner of an original Bill Wishner. Others will be contributing pieces to the collection over the months to come. So I suggest you check out our website periodically to see what's being added. And now here's Justine Manesh. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. My name is Justine Manesh and I'm an advisor at Pasadena Photography Arts. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Manuelo Paganelli. Manuelo is a fine art photographer currently living in Carmel in California. His award-winning work has graced the covers of magazines including Forbes, Life, Men's Journal, Newsweek, and many more. Alongside his commercial work, Manuelo focuses on his humanistic documentary projects, working in the tradition of Cartier-Bresson and Robert Frank. Currently, Manuelo is represented by the iconic Weston Gallery in Carmel, an obscure gallery in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Today, Manuela will be speaking about the importance of long-term <clears throat> photography projects and how he personally was able to develop and pursue the stories he truly believed in. Manuelo has an extensive knowledge of the photography industry. And personally, as my mentor, I have gained so much from his wisdom and experience as a fine art photographer. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Manuelo Paganelli. Manuelo, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. It's, it's such a pleasure being with all of you and thank you for uh, participating and uh, using your time to spend some time with us here and it makes me feel really good. I see some uh, faces um, that I'm known, I know and so happy to see those faces. And uh, so let me start working. Uh, let me start uh, sharing my screen and then we could start rolling. And let's see. Can you see that, the screen? Looks and good. Manuela, can you um, uh, give us the full screen? Yeah, it's... Uh... Mm. No idea what's happening. Okay, try try the play button at the top. Let's see. Oh yes, that will do it. There you there go. 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 Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. 
I'm not a tech person. You can see that. Anyway, thank you everyone for being here. Let me start. Uh, uh, let me give you a background of how everything started for me. It was uh, when I was in college, I went to school in Tennessee. My parents sent me to school and I was flying to high school, then college. I was planning to go into medical school. Uh, my last year in college, I decided I didn't want to go into medical school. I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I bought a camera as a hobby because my life was so, my future looked so bleak. I wanted to do something to forget about it. So then I went to, I got the camera, I went to bookstore mm -hmm. and I wanted to learn about Czech magazines, about photography. And there was this magazine with uh, Enzo on the cover, which I didn't know who he was because I didn't know anything about photography. So I started reading about this man. It was saying that he lives in Carmel by the sea. I didn't know where that was. So I went to my library. I uh, found a map and then saw where Carmel was. And that's where I live now. And uh, a few days later, I called him up and he became my friend, a mentor. Uh, from uh, then, from there, I got a job working at the Chattanooga Times and in 1982. And I'm the one on the left, in case you're not sure. And uh, uh that was my press pass ovales is my dad last name paganel is my mom so i started using his last name then uh, this is some of the work i did uh, while i was working in a newspaper it was a fun job because i've got to meet all kinds of people and interact with so many social economic uh, levels of the uh citizens in Chattanooga. So it helped me quite a bit. I was in the paper for about two years, then I decided to leave. And from there, um, anything that you see, welcome to take a screenshot. And from there, I went to, I got a job at Agence France Press in Washington, DC. I was there for about five, six months. And I think they fired me or something like that. So. That was the best thing that happened to me. From there, I started freelancing uh, for the Washington Post and USA Today. I did that for a few years, for about two years. Then from there, I started, um, I went to work for magazines and that's what I started doing. My first client was Forbes magazine. And after I worked for Forbes, um, I kept showing my work to the magazines. And then Newsweek hired me, that was my Pass for the uh, Congress that uh, would take me everywhere, including um, the White House now and then when I needed to be there. Then I did work for Time, Life, Sports Illustrated, you name it, all those magazines, and kept doing that along with some uh, commercial work. In, um, I was not too happy with the uh, magazine work because I wanted to do something more related to my newspaper work. And um, then the, I started doing some uh, work for, um, I did a lot of work for Men's Journal Magazine, which uh, I love because they love my black and white. So this was a way for me to be working with black and white. And it reminded me of my work with the newspaper. So they sent me to quite a few places. Um, this was a, document, a story we did on this uh, policeman that's in Catania. And it was like two weeks uh, project that took me from Sicily all the way to uh, the Sahara Desert. And that was interesting. And that started, uh, reminding me of what I've been missing and uh, with um, documentary. And around that time, I was already working on Cuba. And this is later, that's why I moved to uh, LA. And because I thought I came to LA in 2001, I wanted to work for doing celebrities because I thought, hey, that's cool. And Hollywood, who doesn't like that? So what's his name? 
because it was so it was not special it, it was not that meaningful to me and i wanted to work with real people um so and in in 90 or 89 i went to cuba searching i was born in santo domingo dominican republic i'm cuban italian too and I knew we have families in Cuba, but nobody knew what happened to them. So I wanted to go there and find them. And so I went there in um, maybe an hour or 90, searching for them and didn't find them until uh, 93. And it was great because um, I was uh, like a child at the candy store and I was pretty much the, pretty much the only person there. There were no, anyone for the USA, very few tourists from Canada, Spain, Italy, and rarely anyone had a camera. So uh, the Cubans, uh, for most Cubans, when they saw me, pretty much uh, I was the first uh, foreigner that they have seen. So it was like, you know, if I was, if I landed from Mars. And as you can see, um, um it was a special because i got to capture images which will be hard to do today due to uh so many tourists everywhere and in 95 i was 96 i was giving a grant uh by the virginia commission for the arts it was five thousand dollars which was really that's a lot of money back then so that helped me to um keep going Plus, magazines were sending me there already, and at the same time, they would send me to do the, whatever they wanted me to work on. I would be um, working on my own projects, and, and this is what was uh, so meaningful to me as uh, it was actually my first uh, documentary uh, project and which uh, I worked like 26 years uh, on this project. And in, in between, uh, there were some failures, and but that's fine. Too. That was fine too, because the value of failure is that give us knowledge and um, experience uh, makes us stronger, uh, make us grow, give us value, appreciate what we're doing. It's also, to me, it was also if, if for uh, motivating. It was motivating for me because when something goes wrong, it makes me work harder. And can work on Cuba. And that was for Vibe Magazine, sent me there to work on a hip hop story. Quite a few magazines would send me there. And that was um, pretty much all over the island. Then uh, industry uh, publications were talking about my work. And in 2016, people kept asking me, how come you don't, you don't publish a book? And I was, I was just busy creating work. I was not thinking about books. Finally, I decided to do a book. Um, I kept seeing some books where some folks would go two or three times, then they will return and voila, they'll publish a book which didn't have much depth and soul to it. When the book was published, then um, it got a lot of publication on news media, I did quite a few interviews from quite a few publications also interview on radios on tv so that helped the book and the book came out like two weeks before fidel passed away so it became a bestseller it was uh, sold out then in 94 i started working on black hat boys project I was working, I was uh, flying from Washington, I believe it was either for Time Magazine or Forbes. And I was sitting next to a black man who was dressed as a cowboy. 
a black person wearing uh, dressed as a cowboy. And I wanted to ask him why he was uh, wearing that clothes. First, I thought that he was probably, you know, when sometimes people hire clowns for birthday parties and things like that. So I thought maybe he was hired to go to a birthday party or something. And so I asked him, and he told me that he was a rancher and black cowboy. And that was the first time I heard that. That was long before the internet. So I got his information, his telephone number. And during the flight, he shared so much about what black cowboys have done and that they were they have been around as long as any other cowboys. In fact, one out of four uh, cowboys in the Wild West, uh, it was a black cowboy. So it was illuminating. I just couldn't wait to return back to DC. I was living in Washington, DC at that time. So as soon as I got back to Washington, DC, I reached out to um, my a few, quite a few of my mainstream magazines um, to tell them about this idea because I want someone to pay. I didn't want to be going everywhere because it would be ex I knew it would be expensive. And they didn't care. They, no one cared about Black Cowboys. And at the same time, when I started going to Cuba, they didn't care. Later, after my fourth or fifth trip, that's when they started showing interest. But with Black Cowboys, nothing happened. And now you see cowboy movies, you see all the people doing Black Cowboys. But at that time, I didn't see anyone. I, no one was interested. Then someone told me about a magazine called Emerge, which I never heard at the time. And it was, uh, they told me it's owned by BET. I didn't know what that was. That stands for Black Entertainment TV. So I called them up. They gave me a number. I called them up and they said, uh, they put me in touch with the art director. And uh, interestingly, you know, the art director used to work for one of the magazines I was shooting before. I think it was uh, Vibe or maybe Newsweek. Anyway, so I was surprised to see him there and he was happy to see me and he loved the story and he ran the, he took me to the uh, publisher, uh, the managing editor of the magazine and they said, we get back to you. And I thought maybe I'll hear from them in a few months or a year, who knows? So they called me like four or five days later and asked me, when can you start? And that was the beginning of my project. And so I started traveling everywhere that there was a rodeo. And it was hard in that time because you couldn't find rodeos. It was worth mouth, um, you know, no internet. And I kept writing a bunch of numbers and names and people put me in touch with somebody else. And that's how I started creating this uh, body of work. At first, it was just a group of images because I wasn't sure what I was going to create. And with time, uh, started getting to be substantial. Um, for anyone that's here that wish to, would like to work on personal projects or documentary, you know, now with the internet, with the with, uh, social media, um iPhones and all that we we know that anyone can be a photographer today but there's a difference of making beautiful images or perfectly looking with Photoshop and then putting it there and yeah they're fantastic but they're single images it's different than doing a group of images that is a cohesive uh tone to it uh, and if it's uh, special, unique, then that could evolve into a large body of work, as I, as I have done with my uh, Black Cowboy. Um, one thing I t tell people is uh, don't just shoot what capture your eyes, uh, but go for the moment, be selective, do research, be focused. Um, and that's what... I started to learn as I was working on this type of projects, uh, make it have to be conceptual and interesting and to have, to be clear. Uh, 
special um, project where your peer can talk about it. Other people can say, hey, you, you, you're you on the right path. And let's see. But they have to fit. Uh, they have to fit together. It's like a puzzle. Um, so you put the pieces together. And with time, you will develop into something that is going to be really uh, interesting. If anyone has questions, uh, feel free to ask. This was a black cowboy. That's why his eyes are closed. Uh, he carries a gun with bullets. And he, um, so he said he's ready. So if anyone comes to his house, breaks in, he said he'll shoot at them. I said, well, you cannot see them. I said, yes, I can, but I hear them. So I know where to shoot. He said, by the time I finish my six bullets, one of them, I'm sure, will hit them. They'll be dead. With a documentary, it requires a commitment. Um, you have to be serious about it. You can't just uh, say, okay, let me work on this and do something else. You, you have to be committed. It takes, uh, it takes a lot of time. Um, Sometimes you have to sacrifice um, things that you do at home. Uh, with my projects, the same with Cuba. There were times, uh, especially Cuba at the time, if anyone has been to Cuba, you see how easy it is to travel there now. Uh, but when I used to go there, there were you can there were no telephones. You couldn't call outside. If you for me to call out of Cuba. I have to go to a this special place, and then they have to you give the number, and then they'll. I have to wait like two or three hours for the call to be placed. That's how slow it was. Also, if I travel from one any any time, I have to travel from one region, one part of Cuba to the next one. I will have to go to a special office, a government office, and I had to tell them why I was going there, where I'm going to be staying. Uh, it was very controlled. And then when I arrived to that place, I have to go to another office to tell them that I have arrived and that I was going to be staying in the place I said I was going to be staying. Also, there were no paladares. That's um, for those who don't know that word. It's like home restaurant where people, uh, Cubans, have restaurants and they could sell food. That didn't exist. That was uh, pro prohibited. And uh, also, you couldn't stay at the house of Cubans like you are able to do now. And uh, there were no new cars. The only cars there were Ladas, Moscovies, and all Detroit cars. Then later on, new cars are arriving, new buses for tourists start arriving but none of that was part of uh, the first seven eight years things started changing more when the pope uh went to cuba when the pope went to cuba that's when things start to change uh in 1980 and 1998 so the same with my uh cuba um project uh, with my black cowboys, people knew I was working and doing those projects, so they started writing about my my Cuban my black cowboy from my black cowboys project. In uh, 2020, due to the pandemic, I decided to do a travel log across the Midwest. I couldn't go anywhere. I was working two other projects uh, overseas. And I decided to just go and go to the Midwest. So I went to quite a few places there. It was interesting to Ed, see. Sorry to interrupt. We just have one question uh, before you move on. Um, someone is asking, are you still shooting the Black Cowboys or are you finished with that project? No, I'm still shooting the Black Cowboys. Uh, the moment I probably finish this project is probably when my book, uh, book comes out. Uh, I'm even... 
that's just something interesting. You know, photographers, we never shoot a project. Um, if I'm, I do photo workshops and different places, including Cuba. So if when I go there, if I see any interesting image, um, then yeah, I'll capture. Because that's what we do. That's that is our life. Uh, that is who we are. And so we never stop. So always, uh, even if you want to have a project right now and you finish that project, don't don't even say that. How about I post the project? But if you see something, uh, any if you're in any moment, uh, a particular moment in a situation where you see images um, that would be great for what you've been creating, of course, you work on them. And so, yes. I'm still working on the Blackout Boys uh, project. That was a that was a that was a good question. So traveling to the Midwest, I saw so many things, so dead animals, uh, met so many interesting people. Uh, people are really kind, friendly, for the most part. You know, it's MAGA land. But in, in there, they don't care about any of that. Uh, they're just wonderful people. Uh, I met um, this guy is from Mexico. And he came about 10, 12 years ago. Then met that girl from Florida. So that's their daughter. He started his uh, business. Uh, he's a contractor, so he's doing well. So that's the um, it was great meeting the soul and grain of the USA. Um, it was a wonderful experience. I met a lot of farmers, farmers that would just drive in and say howdy. And uh, such as this man. In fact, um, when I told him who I was, I wanted to photograph him. First thing he said, so do I have to pay you? He thought it was going to charge him for the pictures. I said, no, no. So he didn't understand why I wanted to take his picture without charging or anything like that. He was interesting. I asked him, oh, I love your truck, you know, that old truck. I see how much you pay for. And he said, oh, it's none of your business. <laughs> you know, all folks, the straightforward. I said, I get it. And then I said, okay, so how much if I find a truck like that, how much you've seen that would cost me? I say, I'm not sure, but I'm not selling this one. <laughs> but for the most part, people are really cool, very friendly. And uh, I ended up at uh, the Amish uh, community in Iowa. That was so much fun. I spent a week with them. I connected really well with them. They welcomed me uh, to their homes. I got to work with them. I got to milk goats and things like that and uh, spend time. I got to eat with them and they will bake bread for me. And um, I did two Midwest tour. The first one was in 2020 and this one was 2021. By this time, I bought a trailer hitch, which I I would pull on my, I have an XUV uh, X5 BMW, so I pull it and I was able to sleep and cook in there. But uh, Amish folks, they will give me bread, they will make, uh, or give me a um, liter of uh, goat milk, which is really good. I had it before, so it's, it's great. So it, it was interesting spending time with them. I learned so much from them. They're different from the uh, Pennsylvania, Deutsche um, Amish people. Uh, they do things differently. So that was a really, really uh, special story. And yeah, they also flirt. So I flirt back. Manuela, yes. Deb Debbie Arluck has a question. Can, yes, you yes. Talk, can you talk more about how you begin conversations with the people you photograph and how you develop relationships with them? Yeah, the I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go with the second one. Uh the second one is the uh, the second one you have to just uh, go with the flow because to to engage them uh, have a, something personal with them is 
meeting them right there. And but there are ways to do it. Um, uh, with the Amish, um, I uh, started talking to the first person I met was a couple of girls. Then I asked, uh, were they by the, is there a store I could go? I need to go and buy some food. Because, uh, you know, they're in the middle of nowhere. It's not like the, the big town is there. So I figured they must have a store. And they told me where the store was. So I went there. And the uh, it's run by Amish people. It's all Amish community. And the guy was really friendly. And I started talking to him. And then he gave me names of other people. So that started opening the path for me to meet all these folks. And... Um, um, but let's say uh, you are not with Amish people. Let's say, let's say you are, uh, let's say somebody that you, you are the park and someone is fishing or flying a kite or whatever. And you know, you can make great pictures. First of all, I don't, I don't go to people and say, man, I, I don't ask for permission. I just shoot. Because the moment you go and ask permission, that moment is going to be gone. Sure, the, uh, there are moments that you must ask. There are times that it, it, it comes, it, you have to. But for the most part, I don't. Uh, but this is the way I have done it. Let's say there's someone fly fishing, right? So I, and, and perhaps I don't feel like I feel uneasy. I'm not comfortable. So what I do is approach them and I say, if I see that they have a bucket with a lot of fish, obviously they're having a great time, they're doing well. So then the first thing is say, wow, you're really having a great day. What kind of fish, is that kind of fish or what is that? That opens a conversation. And then you could say, I tried fishing a couple of times and I miss it so much. See it right there. Now he's talking to someone that has fished before. So that start opening the pathway for them to react in a positive way to you. That makes sense? You find an angle. If uh, when uh, I did, um, when I did a lot of work for magazines where they would send me to someone's house or office, the first thing I did, um, you know, when I was shooting for magazines, uh, usually the person will not be there. So maybe the assistant is there or somebody else. And then we are we had to set up. And then the person will arrive an hour or two later, so whatever, you know, three hours later, depending how long it would, would take to set up. So the first thing I would do while my crew was setting up it was looking at the office. I would look at the photograph. I see what they have. If I see someone playing tennis, well, I love tennis. If I see someone scuba diving, I love scuba diving. If I see someone uh, with uh, Formula One cars or football, soccer, you know, real football, well, I grew up with that. So then I could, I know what to ask. So when they arrive, when they come before the this, this section starts, I said, wow, was that uh, was that at uh, the French uh, Roland Garros French Open or Wimbledon? It's W19. So, you know, then, wow, this guy knows what I, he likes what I like. So it opens up faster. So every time you're in a situation where you want to photograph someone, look at them, see, look at what they're wearing. Maybe they're wearing some cowboy boots. And you said, those are really cool cowboy boots. I wish I, had, I I wish I was wearing mine today. You know, even if you don't have one, you could say that, you know, but hopefully you have one. So try to say something that it will connect you to them besides, hi, I'm a stranger. I have a camera. No, forget the camera. So approach them. Finding something that you have that they will have in common with you and that opens doors so fast you know and uh, if you see a picture of their children uh 
And uh, oh, there I see. I have a song that's at USC. You can mention that, which I do, or UCLA, which I do. So, or even if they went to school in the South, you can say, wow, is that Georgia Tech? I went to, I used to live in the South, you know? So you mentioned something that you have in common. Does that answer the question? Gives you an idea? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, good to see you here, Deb. So, um, so that's what you do. I mean, these are Amish, you know? They are, they are not saying... There's, it's not like they're looking and you say, oh, guys, you come from L.A. Here, come, let me hug you. No, they, that, that's not who they are. So you have to find ways to approach them and be delicate. I mean, I didn't go, okay, for this, I didn't go with my camera, click, 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 click. No, no. First, I wanted to meet who some of those people who run that town. And then little by little, I start getting my Leica out or have some blood, start snapping images. And then, hey, let me help you with this. Hey, blah, blah. It took time. I was there for a week. So the first day, there was not first and second day. There was first day, there wasn't any photography. Second, I was shooting. So that's how things evolve. See, they give you that. They gave me that. They facilitate me. They, they they welcome into their private lives. And anytime you have you are gifted with that, then you want to do images who will honor them, do it with dignity, uh because they're trusting their life, they're trust trusting their daily life, their privacy with you, a stranger. So you see, that was the end, up towards the end. I mean, I was, see, that's how close I'm, um, that's how they welcome me. So <laughs> you can do it too. Just find a way to connect. That is the key. And you don't have to do it right away. So there's some, there, there are moments where you might have to be there for two weeks before anything happened. But if it's a project that is important to you, that's what it takes. That's why I said it takes commitment. You know, you cannot just go to a place and think, oh, let me do this image in two days. It doesn't work that way. Uh, some people may do some images that way, but later on, you're going to see it. And it doesn't have that deep meaning to it. Uh, does you understand what I'm saying? Yes. We absolutely. Manuelo. Yes. I, I was just going to ask. Um, you mentioned that you work with a crew. Um, what does the crew consist of? How many people do you work with? And well, and how does that affect what you're talking about, which is connecting with people, and um, and having you and the crew sort of disappear. Um, in order for them to just be in front of the camera? Yeah, that was a great question. The crew, well, I mean crew, that's mostly one doing uh, magazine work, like for Time, Life, Forbes, or commercial work. I have a crew. Could be three assistants, could be four. For this, it was pretty much me. And the first leg of the, the first part, 2020, I left. Uh, I didn't have the trailer uh, hitched. So I was staying in motel and things like that. So uh, a son, a friend of my, one of my son's best friend, Sam, they, they had just graduated from, uh, they graduated from a school in LA, it's called Crossroads. And uh, so we sent, that was before COVID because this, this happened, this trip happened because COVID. So we, we took our son to France. He was gonna be there for a year. And so we flew him to Paris, stayed, stayed there for like a week with him, make sure that he settled. And that was his first uh, trip to Europe. So I was trying to help him about European culture. Then, of course, and then Sam went to uh, Germany. And uh, I used to live in Westwood, um, right there by UCLA, before we moved to Carmel for good. So then, Came COVID and my son returned and Sam returned. 
uh, was doing uh, classes at USC online, only like everybody else. Sam didn't want to do that. And my wife said, "Why do you? When this trip, I have already. Um, when when Sam graduated from Crossroads that summer, uh, he, my wife said, "Why don't you take Sam on to Ecuador with you?" So he came to Ecuador with me. So he spent three weeks with me. Anyway, uh, so on this trip, I said, "Sam, I'm I'm going to the Midwest. Why don't you come with me?" And that was great because he was helping me to drive. But the thing is that he didn't know to he didn't know how to drive that much. So he, he pretty much learned while he was helping me. So Sam, was, it was only one person. And then my second leg of the trip, uh, one of my daughters came, my, our youngest daughter, and she was part of the trip with me. Then she got tired and she left. And then she came back later to help me drive back. So so pretty much on this, I was uh, with the, the Amish. I was with my daughter. And uh, but a lot of those images, I was fairly much alone other times with either one of them so the crew it was just for uh shooting for magazine because uh uh the client was paying for all of that so that was good does that answer that question yeah um but but the other part of the question was um if you have a crew with you um how do you keep them from becoming um a distraction oh oh i see i see i see uh everything is clear before uh, the crew i have obviously um i have worked with them so they know they 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 think for me that's how good they are but if it's a new person that's a great question if it's a new person i tell them exactly what i said listen you there you have to be quiet you're going to be in the background you don't say a word you just help me and of course if the the uh, subject comes and say hi to you and show cams say hello that's fine ask you where you're from that's fine just don't keep engaging you stay in the back um one time um i was doing a cover for Forbes magazine i was shooting uh you guys uh you know del monte those uh vegetable you know those can del monte right sure yeah, so I was I, I was shooting the CEO of the Del Monte, and we had we we rented the studio, and it was such a big production. They they brought like a full truck of all their fins. I mean, the whole studio was like full of cans, full of everything, and <laughs> because it was for a cover, right? So there was this girl, the young girl, that have, have asked me if she could come to my shoot because she wanted to learn. She was studying photography. And I had sec I was not sure, you know. Finally, uh, um, um, someone said, no, give her a break. Uh, that'll be good for her. I said, OK. So she came to shoot. I told her exactly what I said to my, my crew. Listen, you are in the background. You are invisible. So don't approach the subject. Just help look and if you see people need help you you there or and i told her to stick with someone for, because while i'm shooting only one person of my crew talks to me because i'm so focused that i cannot be talking to everyone and everyone knows what they have to do so uh we were shooting film we were shooting i uh, was shooting with the Hasselblad so i had shot like 12 shots like 12 rolls and then um, it was time to take a little break. I like to take a break to, you know, to chill out and give the subject a, a, a relax and a little downtime. And that time also, uh, part of the crew is uh, putting film in my bags. I had like four Hasselblad bags. And the other part of the crew is setting up a different situation, changing the lights. While that was happening, this girl, huh? the girl that I wasn't sure if I should bring in, I saw her talking to the CEO. She went there and she was talking to the CEO. And I wasn't paying attention. If one, the guy who is always with me said, oh gosh, that girl is there talking to him. I said, what the heck? So then she left and I saw the face of the CEO that was happy, energetic, and he was a little upset. 
no idea what happened. And I, I so I went to her and I said, you go there and stay there. I'm going to find out what's going on. So I went, to, so I knew something happened. I saw his, his reaction. And I'm so glad you asked me that question. So I went there and said, listen, I don't know what happened, but what happened? I mean, I'm so sorry. You know, she's a young girl, a college student. I just trying to, she was like an intern so she could learn from me, you know? And I said, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. No, no, but what happened? Please tell me. This is what she, this is what she said to him. So what she said to him, she insulted him on the company. She said, don't you get tired of eating this, all this junk all the time? Oh, God. <laughs> the CEO of Del Monte. I mean, hey. he, flew, he flew for the, for, for the shoot, for a cover of Forbes magazine. No, 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 like Alabama Weekly magazine. Forbes. This guy could have, he could have stood up at that moment, walk out without saying a word and leave. He did he did he didn't need all any of that. Right. <laughs> right? Right. So I went to that girl and said, walk out. I don't want to see you again. I apologized to him. He said, no, no, everything's cool. So he stayed, you know, it was not a problem. But you know, he couldn't leave when I'm, you know, when we're shooting portrait <clears throat> for a magazine, especially for a cover or any, any, anything like that. <laughs> usually the first few roles or shot. It's like warming up the subject, relaxing that person. The best shots comes toward the end. So I could have I could have been left with none of my best shots, right? So right. So yeah, so it happens. So so always talk to your crew. I mean, if we have time, I'll give you another story that happened to anyway. And uh yeah, so on this tree, I met, I met farmers, I met hunters, uh, policemen, sheriff, troopers, um, fire, uh, I spent time in fire department. I went to, uh, that's a bed on the, on the far, uh, in the background, the left. And then this two, this gentleman on the right came with his uh, grandson. That's when his bull, and he was there because he went to see if the bull, uh, was Burl, if he could get cows pregnant, you know, I wanted to see if he had sperm. So they had to check this, the sperm count, all of that. So it was interesting. You guys know how the sperm count is done in bulls? No. Okay, I didn't know either. So actually, what, what if you see the, uh, the vet in the back, you could see, you might see something plastic in one of the hands. So what he actually does is he goes behind the bull and he put his hand all the way in into his rear end, what we call ass, all the way in. So imagine that. And then he does something there and then pulls it out. And you see his different color when he pulls it out. Yeah, that's how he did um, track the sperm of the bulls. So then the, the, the farm, I got a lot of picture of that, but I, I'm not showing those here. <laughs> so then I made, that, I made a farmer. And I said, where you folks uh, live? I told him who I was. I said, well, I would love to come to your farm. I said, yeah. I said, we're doing something, but we'll be there like in an hour. And I said, okay, so I'll be there in an hour. So I went there and that's their farm. So I spent a great time with them. I spent like um, um, all afternoon pretty much. That's after they released, uh, it was two bulls. So they released the bulls. <laughs> And Manuel, we have one more question. Um, yes. Currently, are you shooting analog, digital, or both? This, I shoot black and white, T Max 400. Hmm. Uh, with, I shoot with Hasselblad, I shoot with Leica M6. <clears throat> There's, uh, there was one image here. Digital, it was a color image. Uh, I don't know if you remember a picture of color image of a farmer in Cuba. I could show it to you later. So,
this is uh, pretty much black and white. So I'll, I will drive around just searching for images, searching for the right moment, searching for something special. And that was during the hot summer. And I found this a very uh, lovely moment, very sweet. I uh, met a lot of, I went to quite a few rodeos. That was a Black Hills rodeo that's in South Dakota. I mean, I'll meet, so, it was, everybody was so wonderful. Um, I'll go to a place, a farmer's place, a rancher, and they will put, they will give us food to eat, uh, or they will say, uh, if you want to stay here, we have a room here, just stay with us. I mean, you know, these are MAGA people, just to show you that it doesn't matter. I think the, the problem with politics is usually in the bigger city where you get too many fanatics from both sides and both ends of the spectrum. Those folks there, they don't care. They're just human beings, you know? They're just living their life. Of course, they have this strong opinion who they, who they want to vote for, but we didn't talk about politics. <laughs> and they don't care about who you voted for. They're just human beings, wonderful folks. So they were there, uh, you know, saying, hey, stay here. And um, very helpful. Uh, a few times uh, I'll, I'll be outside shooting when it was already almost dark uh, or pretty dark. But still, the sky has some bluish, you know, right before it goes totally black. And um, so I'll be there with Sam or my daughter and uh, people pull over and say, are you folks okay? They want to help. They thought maybe the uh, my truck broke down. See, that's humanity. So it was great seeing that. Uh, Manu Manuelo, I was wondering, when you're doing a project like your 26 years Cuba project, how do you keep it going? You know, it's a long time to be engaged in a project. Yes, it is a long time. I would, um, I would always, I would find different, there's so much to photograph in Cuba. I, I could go tomorrow and find newer projects, newer uh, uh, subjects, uh, interesting um, images, because there's so much to see there. Uh, I know that th sometimes you might go to a place that, that perhaps it has been done before, or you see images that has been taken a thousand of times, like the Eiffel Tower, right? And, uh, or a monument in BC. Um, find angles. Uh, maybe you could go five or two kilometers away uh, maybe less at the Eiffel Tower. Uh, maybe you could find um, a balcony and shoot from there through the trees. Or maybe you could shoot the Eiffel Tower uh, low on the ground where people are work walking and you have the legs showing and in between you see the Eiffel Tower. So it's always about finding different, those angles that um uh, that are there, you just have to see it. Um, you know, everything is there. Everything is there. And you wonder, sometimes you see images and you say, wow, I've been there, but I never saw that before. What did I miss? How come that person got that image and I didn't? It's because a lot of times we don't see it. We have to, it's all there. We just have to look for it. Manuel, this is Bill Wishner. Uh, I did uh, music photo music photography for 20 some years. And um, to be honest with you, I thought that was not the right thing in the end. But I was caught up in the social aspects of my uh, my project. You know, I knew everybody socially, and it turned out to be social events, not not project events. And I realized then I should have cut it off after a certain period of time and moved on to another project because that's how we learn as photographers. We learn by doing different things. 
and not doing the same thing for our entire career. Exactly. You know what? Bill, right? What's yes. your name again? I'm sorry, Bill. Yeah. Wish were, were you here? Um, no, I don't think you were here when I mentioned that because that was before we started. So you probably know Jim Marshall. Well, I knew him, yeah. He's yeah. a character. Yeah, he was. Uh, uh, Jim, Jim Marshall only pointed a gun at me one time. That was enough. <laughs> well, he, he never did that to me because I was, no, he never did it to me. But uh, he was a very good friend of mine. I, in fact, I was saying to folks here before, see, that's some of his work there. I have it. It, right. it wasn't that he wasn't a friend. It's just that when Jim got into his, his uh, ideas about what you were doing or asking him, sometimes he just took out a gun. And... Oh, no, no. He was, he, oh, oh, I know. Listen, he was staying my place when I used to live in Washington, D.C. <clears throat> I stayed with him in San Francisco. And uh, sometimes he pulled the gun and said, take a picture of me. And one time he, uh, he I have a picture of him holding the gun. And, uh, but one time... Uh, he said, take this picture of me. And this is what he did. So this is a gun, right? Pretend this is a gun. He said, take a picture of me. He put the gun in his mouth. I said, no, Jim, I'm not going to take that picture. So, yeah, that's, you know. Anyway, so moving forward. Yeah, you know. So, you know, his, you know Jim, his char the character. So yeah, yeah, so so going back to what you said, that's important too. I'm glad you asked that. Folks, when I started working as a photographer, you know, my background is newspaper. And uh that time I thought that the biggest I thought I love I love uh shooting sports. So I thought, man, sports little straight up. I can't wait to work for them one day, which I ended up doing, but not doing action. But I, I thought. I just want to do sports all the time. I, 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 that's all I want to do. That's the best thing. Then I started showing my work. I went to Newsweek, and I don't know if you guys ever heard of uh, this photo editor, one of the greatest photo editors in the industry. Uh, he was working at Newsweek at the time. His name is Jim Colton. So from there, he went to SI. So I started, that was my first time going to Newsweek. And the first thing he mentioned is how much he loves my sports photography. So, you know, every year I'll go to do the tour, show my portfolio, because, you know, no website, no internet, no to show you where you have to actually physically go there. You guys know that, the older people like me, you had to physically go with the portfolio and show your work, which was, it was great. It was bad that way, because you got to meet those people one-on-one. -on -one. Anyway, so every time he would say, he would say he would compliment my my sports then he hit me just like what you said i don't want to be a sports photographer because i will only shoot for si and who else that was even before we had espn which i ended up working for them but but there were not that many clients doing sports and then i thought i don't want to pigeon uh what's the word pigeon uh Anyway, so I didn't want to just put myself in that situation where um, it was just sports. And I tried to change it with portraits. I started doing other things. I want to evolve. But every time I go back to show my work on news, at that time, I have not done any work for them. So I would show my work to Jim Colton, and there might be maybe one sports, nothing else. And he kept talking about sports. And he's the reason I decided I, I don't want to do that anymore. Just like you said, I, I wanted to be bold. And that's how I started changing because I went to work for other magazines, not just sports, not just doing sports. If, and then when I started working for Sports Illustrated, I had shot for them mostly features, covers, uh, anything but action. It was one on one with the stars. I was, I'll be at home or whatever. So it was more personal. I enjoy doing that a lot more. So, yes, tr try to always. Um, so, going back to the question, what you do when to, uh, if you get uh, tired of working, the same thing, get brain dead, 
or you could see you go to a place that has been shot so many times and those are things when things are happening um either try to find different angles go to where nobody is go to another area and try to see if you could find what you want to shoot from a different perspective or also get out of your zone and go and shoot something else that you haven't done before so it's like a refreshing you know it change your uh inside of your brain rearrange and you could start seeing things that you didn't see before and um uh deb are you still with us i am yes i am yeah. hello okay <laughs> deb is deb is a great example you know i've known deb for since pretty much why i'm moving in late here to la and uh, in fact, we met uh, the Julia Beans when it was in Venice, uh, when she had the place in Venice, because I was teaching for her since then. And um, her work has evolved. Every time I see her work, it's evolving. And uh, then she did an amazing project with her sister and her uh, nephew, that is disabled and she did a beautiful documentary in black and white totally different from what she is used to doing so she is evolving so the same way she did it you all can do it try to don't stick to what you always been doing just go one day out somewhere and find other things and you will see it with time it becomes better uh, same when you work on a project. When you work on a documentary, the hardest, see, these are people from some of the motels, Sam and I stay, more motels, more motels. So, so find something that you, when you work on a documentary, <clears throat> first you do a, uh, first you create a group of images. And you see, you try to put the puzzle together. <clears throat> and with time, you could have a body of work, but that takes time. That takes dedication. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen overnight. <clears throat> and the more you do it, excuse me, the better you become. Other things that I do is uh, I started doing uh, the past few years is that I also write. And a lot of these images I have written about it. If you go to my Instagram account, you can see some of those stories with my images there. It's important to it's important to write. If you could work on writing, it's important. Um, I have done workshop about writing photography then to go with your photography. And it's important because it adds a different dimension to what you have created. It's, it's good when people like to read what the story, the story behind the image. <clears throat> Manuela, I want to tell you, I wrote earlier that your work is, I've always been wowed by your images, your, your portfolio of documentary work and how you connect with your subjects. And I, I also wrote about how you, write about your work that you're just talking about oh, you thanks. really bring us in because not only are you you know you rich with your images and you take us in it's the story and it's the heart and i think that's why i was asking earlier about your connection with people because you know we all might be able to go in and and get some images but you have this great talent for going deeper and as you say, you're staying a little bit, you're staying longer, however long it takes, but you engage with people and they feel it. And then the way you, you know, not all of us are able to write about it as well as you are. And um, all of your stories are engaging. I haven't read one that I was wowed by oh, thank uh, you. in terms of how you write and how you take the picture. So that's I'm right. glad that, that you're here. That's that's really sweet. That's That means a lot to me. Thank you. Uh, and I was on a Forbes, I did assist you on a Forbes uh, uh, cover one time, and I don't remember it was in Ventura, but I think it was the same. Oh, yeah. But I wasn't that girl, just so everybody knows. It wasn't me. 
<laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. You were great, but you were all you were all saying all the shits with me, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Manuela likes to teach, and he does it well. Yeah. He brings people in. So where did you write that? Where can I read that? You say you wrote something before. No, 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 no. I was saying how you. Oh, oh, oh. right here on on the chat. Yeah, on the chat. Oh yeah, I, I, I'm not, I'm not seeing any chat. Maybe I'll see you later. But listen, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you so much. But listen, folks, I I came here as a kid. I came here in '72, and I didn't know a word of English. And I, I was planning to go into medical school. My background, my brain was uh, a structure with sciences and math. And my last year of college, that's when I learned, got the camera. That was the beginning. I had never taken class of photography. And I had never taken class of writing either. It's just where we put ourselves in our brain, our heart. We we have we have we have the best Mac computer in our brain. That's the best computer ever. It's how we make it work and how we change things in our life. And you know, and one thing that I love is reading. I love to read books. And you all can do what I've been doing. Uh, might take longer because. The way I write now is not how I wrote 20 years ago. I have become better. I see things differently. Same with my photography. It has more depth to it. And, um, and that is what I want you to do on if you do documentary work. Make sure that it has depth. Make sure that it has clarity. But be committed to it. Make sure that it touches not only you, but the viewer. But when it gets to the point that when you take an image and you say, wow, I feel like I have something, then you may touch other people when they see it too. It takes time to get all that. Um, this man that was in, in North Dakota, uh, South Dakota, I was saying to North Dakota, and he's one of the farmers that uh, invited to stay. He was, uh, we met him. He was, uh, when we arrived to his farm, there was a deer hanging from being there. He had just killed that morning. And uh, then we went to go somewhere. And then he said, let me show you. So we climb up a hill. And you could, I wrote about this man in my story. And uh, so he was telling me where we needed to go, which way to go. And he is too there. And Sam was uh, going to go. One, one rule of thumb, I have, one rule of thing I have with Sam is, rule of thumb, is that, or anybody that's with me, especially one person, is that never to go a a ahead of me, to stay next to me or behind, because there might be an image where I don't want them there. So this man went there, and he stood there, and he was looking, and at some point he started pointing. I have my Hasselblad with me. I only had like two frames because what well, I was the Leica and the Hasselblad, but the this was a Hasselblad moment, and I think I only had two frames, and I went to pull another. I went to, by then, Sam knew how to roll my, my Hasselblad back and my Leicas. He didn't know anything about photography. Anyway, at the, at the beginning, so he learned Peru, Ecuador. So I wanted to get in our role, like, to Sam to give him our role, but we had left the film in the, in the truck, in the SUV, you know, like 50 or um, like 100 meters um, uh, yards behind, no, like uh, 50, 50 yards behind or something like that. So it was a hill, so um, we didn't have the time because, anyway, so I shot like two frames. I love when he was standing there, uh, he was talking while he was standing there, and I had to capture that image. He reminded me of like John Wayne or somebody like that, you know? And um, so that's the end of my presentation, but working on 
projects that are meaningful, that have that can touch other people, that can work, then can lead you to get gallery representations. Uh, the same way it happened with me. Um, was that easy? No, it was not easy um, because um, I have worked hard. I have I have really um, some. Uh, oh, I said sacrifices before. It takes sacrifices. Um, there were times that I was in Cuba or doing a project, or whatever, different documentary, where I miss my children's birthday where I miss uh, Thanksgiving um, or Christmas or New Year's. So those are some of the sacrifices where that happens. Even my own birthday, I, I spent some, well, I'm one birthday in the middle of nowhere with nobody. One time I was in Cuba. Manuelo, do you have a production team helping you to create the finished product? an editor when you when you have this big huge project um like the black cowboy project do you have somebody help you call the photographs that you want to ultimately use like uh for a book yeah great question my this is this is uh this is my first book cuba you see it's very substantial it's like it's like 5 pounds like 3 kilos uh the editor for this book was Jim Colton, the that guy who used to say ask me about my uh about my um sports. Yeah, sports all the time, right? So he uh so he uh was the editor for my so he did the editing for my book. It's good to have someone who you know, we're photographers, we're not ed editors, unless you're both. I'm not an editor. So hire someone that can help you. And uh, the other day, someone called me, and she's doing a book, and she asked me uh, a few things. And one of the things I mentioned to her is to find a good editor. It's important to have an editor because they see, we are, you know, the images, they're like, uh, we're on, they're like children, you know? And uh, it's so personal for us. So we might choose something more because of sentiment than the quality and the strength of the image. And that's not good. So that's why someone out from the outside looking in can help you, can help us to get the best images that you want um, in a project, a book. For uh, I'm having a, I'm having, by the way, I'm having a, a show in, in uh, January. I'm part of a group show. I'm showing like 20 large images at the Pacific Grove Art Center, which is uh, in Monterey near here. So if any of you are around, uh, you're welcome to come to the show. Um, so Jean Adams, she is the daughter-in-law of Ansel Adams. Uh, I'm a good friend of, of his family, of Anna's family. So she helped me to select the images for the show. And sometimes um, uh, also now I have two galleries that also help me if I have questions to select the images. In fact, for uh, this show, uh, Davi from the Western Gallery, she, she gave me some ideas. So once you have that, you, you have the best people helping you because they're the best. Manuelo, yes, um, would you please um, stop the screen sharing so we oh, yeah. can see you? Oh, oh, you don't see me Since now. We're, well, just just your little thumbnail. There you go. Thank you. Oh, because oh, one sec. Oh yeah. Oh, no, we're good. Yeah. Hi, um, Mike. Hi, everybody. I, I should. I'd also like to ask, um, or I should say, Mike Harris has asked, um, do you have any shows um, in Los Angeles coming up? Nothing in LA, nothing in LA. Okay. So yeah. people have to travel to see your work first. Yeah. Time. Yeah. 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 You know, I mean, unless Fahi or Peter Fetterman call me, they haven't yet. Okay. <laughs> Got it. But for right now, at the, uh, 
Pacific Grove uh, Art Center. In fact, uh, later on, I could send um, I could send uh, the Pasadena uh, Center um, the invitation, so they could send. And they can do that. Alexi can help you with that. And send it to you if you guys yes. would like to have it. Sounds yeah, and we'll, and, uh, we'll post it to, so that everybody can um, um, access it. Yeah, on our website. Yeah, that'd be that'd be that'd be great. If you, yeah. Yeah. Also, there was an article written to about me at the Carmel magazine. They put me on the cover. Uh, I never been on the cover of anything. Usually, I'm the one putting someone on the cover. So it was really cute. Right. So they talk about me and other things about my life. So if you guys wish to see it, I could send Alexi the PDF so she could send it to you. And you could, if you wish, you could read it. Great. So. Manuelo, it's been an absolute pleasure um, having you with us. Um, your work is extraordinary. And um, it's great to hear some of the stories and, and um, part of what is um, behind your process in in uh, bringing that work to life um justine do you have any um last last thoughts that you'd like to add um thank you so much for the show thank you manuela for being here you did a great job and thank yeah. you for everyone who came out yes thanks everybody and um please visit our website if you want updates on on what's happening with manuela and uh, also with pasadena photography arts that's PasadenaPhotographyArts.org. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again in the future. Thanks so much. Thank you, everybody. Ciao. Good night, everybody. Good night. Keep on shooting. Stay humble. <laughs> I'm helping others. Thank you for coming. Very kind. Thanks, Manuela. Welcome.